Everybody, boom shakalaka. Boom shakalaka. Have you ever wondered what are the three things that most people want? Most people do not really want to become very, very wealthy. They just want to make sure that they don't have any financial concerns. If you want to buy a car, you can buy a car. If you want to go on a trip, you can go on a trip. Second one, most people would love to wake up in the morning excited about the day they're going to spend. And three, most people would like to mix with people who are a bit and creatively productive. For over 20 years, I was in the corporate ladder. I was trying to get these needs. And for some reason, that didn't work for me. I couldn't choose who I was engaging with, and I couldn't choose what I would be doing for the day. For the last four or five years, I've been engaging and mentoring very senior executives, top executives, XCOM. And what I came to realize is that these guys have exactly the same pain points. Yeah, money might not be an issue for them, but it's about the perception of money. But definitely they don't have time and they cannot choose with whom they are interacting. It's like if you're in that hamster wheel and you run and run and run and expect things to be different, but for some reason they're not. People choose unhappiness over uncertainty. And there seems to be a pattern that this society brings up, some sort of blueprint. And what we are told is that if you follow that blueprint, everything will, will be all right. Well, many of you know that blueprint. I call it the waterfallish checklist life, which is the one go study, maybe university, check. Uh, find your first job, check. Sometimes find, find a partner, find a couple, check. And sometimes switch jobs, check. Get your first mortgage, check. Get married, for some of you, check. Have your first child, check. Second child, check. Eventually divorce, and then repeat, right? <laughs> So, what's really going on there is, by the end of our days, we wonder if we are spending the life, or we, if we have spent the life the way we wanted. How many of you have heard about Bronnie Ware and her work on the five regrets of the dying? Anybody? Some of you. There's a wonderful woman who is a palliative care nurse who spent, I don't know, 15, 20 years in Australia meeting lots of people and looking after those people that were, some of them, days before, sometimes weeks before, moving on. And she wrote an excellent book that's great for looking at it from perspective, that talks about the five most common regrets that people were mentioning. And the first one, by far, was, I wish I had the courage to live the life true to myself, not the one others expected from me. So, how do we live the life true to ourselves? Anybody really feels I'm really living the life true to myself? Some of you, that's good, that's good. Majority, not yet. So what can we do about that? So these are the four times when we change. How do we change? How do we move from where we are to living a more committed life or more fruitful life? These are the four times when we change. We change when we hurt enough that we have to. We change 
when we see enough that we are inspired to. We change when we learn enough that we want to. And we change when we receive enough that we are able to. Those are the four times when we change. So, we are kicking off this wonderful Lean Agile London 2023 conference. Before moving on, big thank you and big clapping to Jose, JP, Ahmad, Monica, George, and the list of organizers. And we have a lot of expertise in change here. We have a lot of expertise in helping organizations change. So have we tried applying that expertise, that agile knowledge, to ourselves? Have we tried to apply these agile practices, principles to ourselves? Because basically that's what we're about to do now. How can we have a more abundant mindset? more than scarcity? How can we be more empowered? And how can we think big or think bigger? Okay? So, these are the four aspects, the four dimensions that I explored for over four years that have helped me. How are we doing, Marcos? All good? Awesome, awesome, awesome. So, these are the four aspects. First one, and then we'll go one by one. Trick your, your, your brain into believing what you want it to believe. Second one, know your worth and own it. Third, increase your perceived value. And fourth, decrease or minimize non-value activities. Are you all with me so far? Yeah? So let's go on the first one. Which one is the first one? Anybody? Trick your, your brain. Trick your brain into believing what you want it to believe. It, it, it doesn't work this way. Knock, knock, who's there? Hey, lovely brain, this is me. From now on, please stop believing that I'm worthless. Stop believing that uh, I'm an imposter. Stop believing and start believing this instead. It doesn't work. For those of you that have tried changing brain patterns and changing how we think about ourselves, that's not easy. Because basically, the brain works as, as a boating station. And every day, every thought, every action, every emotion, everything that goes through our brain is a boat towards the person that we are becoming. Every day we are consistently boating towards the person that we are becoming. And guess what? There's lots of studies that talk that on a daily basis we have over 50,000 thoughts. 50,000. Some of them are not so useful, like did I, did I flush the toilet? Or what am I going to have, uh, what am I going to have for dinner? But some others, that's what we call rumination, are the ones that we go over and over and over. And over time, we believe that. There's no way we can escape from ourselves. So, what I did in that case is, how can we get to believe what we want it to believe? And this is very strongly related to habits. Anyone familiar with habits and the work from James Clear and others? Yes? Some of you. Good, good. Good job. So, this is a technique called habit stacking. And habit stacking has to do with the idea of you have an already existing habit, something that's automatic to you. Habits are much more about automaticity than they are about repetition. So, you have this habit automatic and then you link it to a new habit you want to have. In my case, I wanted to connect every time that I was unlocking my phone, that's over 100 times a day, 
to having a little nudge, little inkling of the beliefs that I wanted to have. And then I used tools like Anki, which is a space repetition tool. Anybody familiar with Anki? Yeah? Somebody? Then you can have that tool on your phone, and every time you unlock it, it will show whatever you want it to show. You can go for affirmations, you can go for anything. In my case, I just go watch some videos, and then when they, when they talk about something that's remarkable for me, that I want to have more of, I just put it there. And every time I rehearse it, I rehearse it. OK? So that's on the first one. Second, know your worth and own it. Know your worth and own it. Know your worth and own it. Boom shakalaka, everybody. So how do I know my worth? Okay, so we are, some of us here are agile coaches, so we just go to an organization and first thing we do is, hey guys, I mean, there's, there's all these teams, I need to understand how does information connect and how does the, the, the value flow. And what do we do? We do a, anybody? Value stream mapping? So from lean, doesn't matter. So we have this value stream mapping. And in, in that value stream mapping, we try to separate what is value adding for our end customer versus what is non-value adding. OK. Have we tried applying that to ourselves? I call it the item. Have we looked into our individual talents that we want to explore and maximize. How do we do that? OK, so the, here's a simple exercise. You just lock yourself into a room with a deck of post-its. If we don't have post-its, we're not agile. You know that. <laughs> so we get the post-its, and we start writing how our day looks like. You can take the last week, the last two weeks. But do not write what activities you do. Write what talents, what skill sets you need for those activities. Because activities might be training, good, meeting, good. So what are the skills? I need to be empathetic. I need to be a good facilitator. I need to be a um, good speaking public. Anything like that. And then you capture all of it. And you figure out what you do with it. We have over 100 waking hours every week. So it's important to prioritize. It's important to carefully choose where we want to spend our time on. OK? The next one has to do with, all good, Marcos? Uh, such a good guy. So the next one is, how can we increase our perceived value? How many of you here are Agile coaches? Or work as Agile coaches? OK. How many of you here have a coach and you pay them to keep you at your peak? OK. Way fewer. This is my take. I learned that from Jose. Jose, you're, you're there. The shoemaker's son always goes barefoot. So as agile coaches, we go to an organization and we explain, hey, uh, you want to change. It's about mindset change. And then we need to do all these sort of things. And we are the best ones for that. So in some cases, why don't we do that to ourselves? And then um, I recall a conversation I had with Jose. I hope you don't mind me sharing it publicly. Jose was mentoring a, a known CEO, and that CEO would tell him, look, I, I'm not the best at everything, but I want to make sure that I get very good people, those who are better than me at all these elements, so that I can increase my level. And then I thought, well, wow, that's, that's a good idea. So I start mimicking that. And now I have 
public speaking coach for me, personal development coach Dino, startups coach Alberto, financial coach Emin, per, um, personal trainer Adria. So all these coaches are helping me on those aspects that I think I'm good at. They're helping me to get better. We'll look later on on the ones that we're not so interested or are less value-adding activities. But on the, on the ones that are value-adding, on the ones that people recognize and I get some money thanks to them, I want to get better at them. And yes, I, mean, I can go through lots of trainings and I can do lots of things. But one of them is to consistently have exposure to somebody that knows better than you, that helps you get better at it. If you don't exactly know what are the parts that are more valued versus less valued, let's look at one tool that I've been using over time. Before that, if you surround yourself with people who are better than you, the only thing you can do is improve. So what's this tool? This is called Bloom's Taxonomy. Anybody heard of Bloom's Taxonomy? Woo, lots of people. So basically, Bloom's Taxonomy is what you use when you finish a training. You want to figure out what are those takeaways, what level are those takeaways being related to. And, and the new version of Bloom's Taxonomy has six levels. First one is remember, so calling facts. Understand, making sense of what you're hearing or what you're being exposed to. Apply, being able to apply some knowledge, like a recipe. Analyze, how do I break down some particular knowledge into its fundamental skills. Evaluate, how can I compare two bodies of knowledge and figure out which one works better in a certain situation and ultimately create. Create is about being able to apply any specific knowledge in a different context. I call it cross-pollination. The ones at the bottom, the three at the bottom, they're called the low order thinking skills. And the three at the top, they're the high order thinking skills. So if you want to increase your perceived value, most of the times, AI willing, you will want to focus on the high order thinking skills. But ultimately, you get to decide which level you're willing to fly at from flight levels. So, last but not least, how can we get rid of anything we don't want to do, but needs to be done anyway. Okay, let's recall the fifth principle from Agile. Simplicity. The art of maximizing the amount of work not done by you is essential. Okay, let me make a distinction. The work sometimes needs to be done anyway. It's just a matter of, should I do should I do it myself, or should I get it done? And two years ago, I had this, this experience. I was starting as independent. I was having a lot of work. Um, I was having too much on my plate at some point. And you know, have you been in this situation where you just wonder, like, I really shouldn't be doing this? So at that moment, I learned about some platforms. Fiverr, Upwork, etc. And I thought, okay, if I, if I get somebody to do what I don't want to do, I can focus my time, I can prioritize my time into doing more of the value, value adding stuff. And I went through this painful process of getting somebody doing a translation from English to Spanish, I don't remember, that I could do myself in a shorter period of time. So I spend more time getting that translated than I would spend doing it myself. And I think that the cost was $20. 
course, they were so hard to pay. I, I, I couldn't get it. Like, I, I'm, I'm paying for a cleaning person to come home and then do the cleaning. But when it comes to me doing something and then have somebody doing the same, that was harder for me. So uh, I forced myself into outsourcing every month, every month I, I, I was putting some money aside and then investing, investing, investing. And one year later, I just realized, wow, this is one of the biggest change, changes ever. And then I tried convincing my, my fellow friends, Jose, JP, and others, like, guys, come to my training, how to outsource like a pro. And it didn't quite work. And, and one of my mentors, Alberto, told me, you're getting it wrong, Jordi. You're getting it wrong because you're trying to teach people how to fish. And most people just really want the food. So uh, what we did is um, we created a company where you basically send a voice message to a WhatsApp group and, and that stuff gets done. So you get rid of all the blah, 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 and all the app work and all the fiber. You just say, this is what I want to get done, and it gets done. And then I link this very strongly to agile-related metrics related to time. One is lead time. How long does it take from the moment I have an idea till that moment that the idea is in production, we get some feedback, blah, 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 blah. The second one is touch time. How much did they spend on all of it? And then if, if, if you have Dan Bacanti and others in the room, then they will say, OK, the idea is you maximize touch time from, from lead time, then your flow efficiency goes up. Well, not if you want to get your stuff done and you want to get it done to 70 or 80%. You want to minimize your touch time. You want to minimize the amount of time that you're spending on something that needs to be done, but you don't want to do it yourself. But then I realized there's, there's, there's a third metric that we haven't paid much attention to. And I call it ignition time. How long does it take from the moment I have an idea till that, the moment that idea gets actioned? Well, in my vision, it should take less than 10 seconds. You take out your phone, start voice recording, and then say, I need a new website for this, 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 and that. And then it gets done, ideally. OK? We have 13 million people only in this platform. I know we just go, and sometimes it's just, ah, I need a new logo. Good. If you need a new logo, if you need a new website, ah, uh, OK. So you go there. What about if you need somebody to do some calculations, if they need to do some research, if they need to create anything you want, anything that is not high or the thinking skills, you can develop the ability to outsource it to somebody else and spend more time doing your stuff. OK? So back in the day, I spent 20 years in the corporate world. And I was going through this blueprint that I wanted to do efficiently and ultimately get the reward, happiness, satisfaction, etc. And there was this item in the checklist, in the waterfall is checklist life, that didn't pan out the way I was expecting it. We had a daughter. And that completely altered everything that I was believing. I didn't want to pursue any more higher positions. Uh, I was senior director at that point. I left the global organization. I wanted to spend more time with her. So that's why I had to figure out how can I get better at having a perceived value than minimizing what I don't want to do. We only got this, we didn't only get this far, only to get this far. So my advice to you is invest in yourselves. Spend time figuring out what are you good at and how can you increase that value. Figure out how can you get 
<coughs> those parts that you don't want to do <coughs> done by someone else. Those of you that are in, in stocks, do not put money in the S&P 500. Put money in the S&P 500. Spend time around that. Here's four agile inspired tools. Trick your brain into believing what you want it to believe. Use space repetition, use Anki, link it to your daily habits. Make it work for you. Two, know your worth and own it. Figure out what you do well versus what you do not do so well and figure out a way to maximize that. Three, increase your perceived value. Look at Bloom's taxonomy or look at um, who are those that can teach you how to do these things and get them as coaches. And fourth, minimize simplicity. Try to get rid of everything that needs to be done for you but you don't want to do yourself. Okay? So, let me close with this. I wish we all have a lean, agile London true to ourselves. At least we all, I wish we all have the courage to live lean, agile London true to ourselves. Network, experiment, exchange ideas, figure out uh, what you know and what, what you can learn even more. Get out of your comfort zone. If you're speaking for the first time, good luck. And above all, unleash your mindset. Boom shakalaka. Thank you. Questions?